Hi, good evening, Shah. How are you? Hi, Mustafa. How are you? Good. Thank you very much. How's the uh, water fasting going? It's good. I'm actually on my last day, so I did from Sunday to Wednesday, um, 72 hours. Uh, you know, I, I, I'll do it now. I've been doing it now since a year, every month for three days. And it's always good because when you go home and you have your first meal, which we can't exceed more than 400 calories, otherwise my you know, body will go crazy by you know, distributing, too much, getting out too much insulin. Um, so I'll just have like three eggs and maybe some cheese. Um, and next day I'll have to cap it to a thousand calories. And then from Friday onwards, I can live a normal life, hopefully. Wow. Okay. Yeah. You, and you've been following that for a year now? Yes. Every month once. Yes. Wow. That's, uh, Sometimes that's, I've that's, been that's cheeky and I've done, done it twice a month, but it's not recommended. That's, that's determination. Um, how, how, do you feel any different since starting this, uh, this, this yeah, whole diet? You, so, you know, I feel much more clear. I think clarity of mind is one of the most important things. You know, uh, I think, you know, um, before that, when I was working at the Hut Group, uh, running their Asia team, you know, there were so many weird thoughts in my head that were irrelevant. But since, uh, you know, I was, I was not able to see, see clearly, I didn't even know what I want, but I think it helps you do, especially for ADHD people, which I, I would highly consider myself uh, as part of that. Um, I would probably highly it, consider myself one as yeah, well. <laughs> it, it brings you down and, and it makes you be able to kind of gather your thoughts and, and, and be more clear about uh, what you're kind of trying to, to achieve. I should definitely, yeah. uh, I should definitely try that. I've always, yeah. it's, I think the fear of it has prevented me from uh, even giving it a go so far, just because I, 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 I eat. <laughs> it doesn't really show, but I, yeah. I, I tend to eat um, at random, random hours. So that's probably the fear of that. That's what stopped me. I probably should really try it if the results are you so should. good. It's not easy in the first time, I'll tell you. You might faint, but uh, it's doable. Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you very much. How long did it take you to get used to it then? You've been doing it for a year. So I think after a year, it's become really easy. Um, but before the first one was quite hard. Um, and, first month, the first uh, time you've done it, basically. Yes. And then I, I always do sport as well. So I was like the first day doing it. I, I said, look, I'm going to do a mild sport. So I did yoga and I was really like almost like fainting. Um, but now I can do like cardio, Barry's boot camps, like second day, third day with no problem. Um, wow. But uh, yeah, now I think my body I... kind of got used to it. I, I have, I have, I've tried fasting for Ramadan before, um, and I, I, I used to play basketball uh, competitively, but I would do that knowing that, okay, I can eat at the end of the day, but I've never been in this situation. So yeah, like I said, my fears probably always stop me from doing it, yeah. but I should definitely try it. I should definitely try it while I have the yeah. chance. Okay, look, thank you for joining us today. It's, um, yeah, we're here to talk about... Uh, crypto in general, generally is crypto, but we're here to really discuss a specific thing and that's Noah, aren't we? Yeah. We want to talk about Noah. That's what we really want yeah. to talk about. Not Noah, yeah. the prophet, Noah, uh, you know, if, 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 if you um, follow history and religions, but the new startup. So is it Noah crypto or Noah bank? First of all, it's going to be Noah bank. Uh, but obviously, we'll actually we're acquiring all domains. Um, it's going to be Noah. Uh, it's uh, just for itself. Um, and I think the reason behind this is, and I will probably talk about that later, is it is a name that is universally known in every country, um, and uh, it, it's kind of a name that has has association with helping people, um, you know, saving people. Uh, and that's why we kind of uh, went for it. And it's kind of something that everyone understands. It's basically like, you know, mango, uh, this brand. Uh, I mean, everyone in every country understands what mango means and kind of like they recognize it quite quickly. Of course. So before we dig in then to Noah, before we dig into that, why don't we just discuss and hear you tell us about Shah, the journey to get to here. How did we get here? What what were you doing before this? Yeah, so I I'm I was basically uh, born and raised in Switzerland. My parents are uh, Iranian. Um, they actually moved out to Switzerland to study at um, 
in, in engineering school at ETH and EPFL. Um, so um, they kind of decided to stay. Uh, I can understand why. And, and um, you know, I was kind of uh, grown up in Zurich. Um, had always a very strong passion for, for entrepreneurship. I was always like doing some stuff here and there. I don't know, working for restaurants, selling sausages. I, I was always like very into like, you know, doing all sorts of just to make money. Um, and, and, and I was always very uh, amazed by all these, like, you know, I, I had a very strong obsession with Steve Jobs and, and, I, and I think everyone who can, wants to talk about Steve Jobs, I, I know all the details, like to, you know, the people who have kind of started his brand, like to everyone who was like, I just have done a lot of, so I had a very strong in, uh, interest in like people who came with very bold ideas and then, you know, went kind of to uh, a lot of challenges. And that was not just, you know, him, it was like every, everyone in that space, but also including generals, like, you know, I would say Bismarck to uh, Marcus Aurelius, all these guys I was always very interested on. I think it was more about this person who has a high ambition and then, you know, goes through all these challenges, but then through the journey becomes stronger and kind of that story was always appealing to me. And that was, you know, entrepreneurship 101, you know. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I, I and that and, and the reason for that is basically because I was put at a very low school when I was in Switzerland. I think part of it was me being a foreigner in, in a fairly conservative country. Um, so it was like the lowest type of school, which was secondary B. Then there is secondary A, and then there is gymnasium. So and then there is like going to university. So I was like put down, and, and my thing, my my objective was my my my, my ambitions, with my my basic prospects would have been. Okay, so you are gonna, you know, work in a construction site, or you know, I don't know, like very, very basic jobs. Um, and at some point, and back then I was a heavy gamer, so I was like World of Warcraft all over my day, you know, Counter Strike. That was like PC games was my thing. Which um, I'm guessing that's mid mid 2000s World of Warcraft. Then. Yeah, mid 2000s. Uh, I think World of 2000s. Warcraft came out 2004, if, I, if I'm not wrong. It was one of the biggest game changing games out there because it was. Basically, what all League of Legends and these guys are building on top, but it was so far ahead of its time, and it was one of those games that you could basically live in the game. Um, but anyway, so um, and then I, I basically managed. Uh, I don't know. I somehow wake woke up. I got tired of gaming. I was like, okay, you know, I loved games. I'm good at game. You know, playing games and winning. And as I, I said, <coughs> okay, I want to just get up the career ladder and kind of prove myself. And it didn't take me more than eight months to get to secondary B uh, A. And then from secondary A, the guys were like, it's so tough, you know, you can't get to like, you just got here, like, what is your ambition? I was like, you know, I want to get to gymnasium because I want to go to university. And then, and then I, I, I basically, um, despite, you know, advice, I didn't care. Then that, that, that was the kind of like a habit I started to, you know, kind of habitualize. Um, I got also to gymnasium, but I had to take a, whole, a huge bet. So gymnasium, there are two paths. There is either you go by, you know, the public ladder where, or you go basically, on a day in Bern, which is the capital of Switzerland, and you give the exams, which are extremely tough. That route is tougher, like 25% get accepted. The other one is easier, but I had no chance because I wanted to get to get to um, university without losing a year. Um, and then I did it, you know, I, I kind of worked out and, and, and then I went to gymnasium, uh, sorry, in, to St. Gallen, which is now I think fourth best university in Europe. Um, it's among the German speaking, mm -hmm. the best business schools you can get to. Um, and then I remember the first year, there's dropout year, uh, dropout, um, dropout rate of 50%. Um, and, and my dad, you know, tapped on my shoulder and said, you know what, if you don't make it the first year, it's fine. All my friends, kid, kids kind of failed the first year, you know, they kind of have to figure out how, how it works. And I was like, I was like, no way I'm going to uh, fail, you know, and then I kind of, and that was kind of like the start of everything. And even during my studies, um, I started this, you know, I was part of initiating this conference called Start Summit, which. Back then, you know, entrepreneurship was very fairly small thing. It now became the largest entrepreneurship conference in Switzerland. Uh, I went to you know, like kind of UCLA to meet all the entrepreneurs. You know, being an Iranian, I kind of like reached out to a lot of I don't want to say names, but everyone who was Iranian and sold a, a company over a billion. Um, I thought that that's wow. what I could leverage because I could go to these people and say, guys, you know, I'm Iranian. I'm hungry. Like I am like not, not, not so far than you were 10 years ago. So talk to me. Um, and with that, I, I became increasingly bold because I could see how I could get to people by being ex extremely like, you know, having bold statements and, 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 and you know, going and going after it. Um, but then I came back to uh, Switzerland. Obviously, you know, I wanted to start companies, but, you know, in a way, 
if you're in Switzerland, you're not very encouraged. And back then, 2014, it wasn't that big of a trend, to be honest. Let's be honest. Like the only guys that were out there were Rocket Internet, and 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 that's it. Um, so I was like, look, why don't I go and build up some confidence? Uh, because you need a lot of confidence in European markets to be able to like start companies. Um, and 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 I worked for went to work for Lazar and 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 in, in Geneva for private equity. And I remember they were like, okay, we're only gonna hire people who have had three years investment banking experience. And I, my attitude was like, fuck that, you know, like, I don't know what these guys are talking about, but I'm sure that job isn't that difficult. So I emailed this guy so many times. I emailed actually a lot of people, like maybe over 100, 200, and, and harassing them almost. Um, and this guy, and I have this email still for anyone who wants to see it, but this guy came back and said, look, you're not really qualified for this job. We, hired, we ended up hiring someone else. We also hired you because we thought um you know you're extremely passionate about it and we have not seen that very often with within people so we'll give it a chance i was like great so i did that for a year it was amazing obviously it wasn't my thing because i think it was one of those where within the university everyone speaks about it private equity it's being extremely ex exciting but then you go there you're like this is just like bureaucratic work um and then same with ubs i went to work for the m a department in switzerland you know i was excited day one but i realized it's just the paperwork um like n no one is doing anything innovative here um and then um you know i decided to kind of uh, go to london um you know and then i worked for a hedge fund for two years um and and i also started a company in the middle east after that where we raised some money and then exited fairly quickly i was kind of a, a b2b car marketplace and um like pretty much like auto one it's called hodro 45 uh, it's doing actually quite well and you know billboards of the company all over the country um and then so having partially entrepreneurial experience and i always like started something here and there uh, but still wasn't very convinced to dive into um because when i went to middle east i i basically had to do a lot of car dealing stuff like dealing with car dealers and i realized i was extremely educated um and extremely like um well versed but when it came to dealing with like the sharks of the underground world, I would fail. I, I got really scared of that. I was like, wow, if you want to run a business, you need to be at the same time smart, but also at the same time, extremely short and uh, short and commercial. And, and I, and I basically went back to Europe after six months and I was like, okay, what is the most shrewdest company out there in Europe? Then I looked at rocket internet. It wasn't really convincing because i think back then they were like kind of trying to figure out what they want to do um and and the hot group was the only one that stuck because it was the story which just made sense the founders were you know accountants like you know not no previous i would say privileged background and 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 they managed somehow to build this like massive company and back then i uh, when, I, when i was interviewing it was still like small fairly and and when you talk to the guys there they were extremely like ambitious, extremely aggressive, and also um, extremely um, relentless. You could see that like they were all like sport mentality. You know, they would wake up at 5.30. And, and I knew from all my learnings, you know, throughout the years, and also looking at investments that, you know, it's not all, sometimes the smartest people, but also like the most resilient people that succeed and manage to build great companies. And, and I said, okay, I have to work here. Uh, because the clash between my educated background and and, and, the <clears throat> and these guys is going to be amazing, right? And then they were actually not convinced at first to hire me because they're like, you know, we had tons of people like you, smart people, but then they come, they fail, you know, they talk too much about theory. I was like, you know, hang on a minute, you know, you should give me a chance. You know, I had some like pretty like tough background, you know, not, I wouldn't say soft tough, so that's a long word, but, you know, some at times where I had to like figure out things and I, and I know what you're talking about, like, when your path is not clear and you have to figure out the way. Um, and that's what they really wanted because they basically throw stuff at you and like figure it out. They have no processes. Um, and then I was there first as head of commercial, kind of like co-leading on integration. So every time they would buy a company, it would go within a team and integrate that. That was quite interesting. The reason they put me there was because it was one of some of the, some, you know, it was kind of the toughest thing to do um, uh, because everything goes wrong. Um, and then later on, I was promoted to run their Asia division, a team. Um, and um, that was quite interesting. It was a large p &L, you know, it was a big responsibility, big team. And I did what that for a while. And what, was the what, what does the team do? 
So we have, so within the division, you would have, you know, like the trading team, which is responsible for PL and like daily campaigns and whatever. And then you have the marketing teams, like long term planning and, you know, budget allocation. You have business development who would like build out, like, you know, our partnerships with Alibaba, Tencent, and these guys. And you'd have then, uh, as on top, you would have then, um, um, like, let's say, buying, if you would like buy products from third parties or procurement. Um, and then finance uh, as well. So you basically that that was the main team, um, and um, yeah, it was uh, extremely interesting and it was extremely challenging because you know the expectations are extremely high. So you have to every day come in straight sharp, um, and uh, you know I we used to wake up like at I'm still waking up early, but we used to wake up like at five five and then be five thirty in the gym, the gym that was owned by THC itself. It was called the in the Hale Country Club, um, and then you know six thirty seven we were at, at at the office and like you know kind of like getting stuff done. Wow, um, six thirty seven, and I thought being at the office at seven thirty was early enough for me. <laughs> back in yeah, the day. it was a bit different because in finance it was more like you wake up late and then you work late night. But in operation there, I mean, I, I see it across is like going early because you have this like three hours time to get everything in and plan what the day will be because your day is always juggling around a thousand things and not really like sitting down and researching. Um, mm. So you basically like, you see, okay, oh my God, I have so many things to do. Now, what's the, what's the strategy today? And then you'd like you bring your teams in, bam, 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 and then you kind of like evaluate end of the day how it runs and you kind of like try to get some sleep as well. Um, so I did that for a while and last year I left, um, I think it was straight up before COVID. So um, it was, um, you know, I, I basically saw that industry a bit like get, getting mature and I wouldn't see my career progression there. Of course, you know, you would have always a career progression, but I wouldn't see that e-commerce is really changing the world um, or what, at least what we're doing. You know, there are obviously other technologies that are changing the world, you know, like in-store um, tracking and all these things. But that particular thing we were doing was quite mature. Um, and so I was keen to change because I was still young. Um, and then, you know, I went and started a company um, here and there. It went quite well. I, I, wanna, I don't want to go too much in detail about it, but that one kind of scaled quite quickly. But, you know, we were like, we are now selling it or, or um, probably like put a CEO on to kind of manage it. But I really needed something that will change the world. You know, uh, you know, I, I, I really like um, wanted something that has the potential to change the world and has the potential to touch many lives because you know, I, I was tired of jumping around so many tasks. I, I wanted to focus on one more, one thing for the next 10 years. And, and then I came across Noah's my that previous thing? employer. Yes, no is that thing. So I, wow. I came across, uh, yeah, I, like basically like help and lead a project on that sense, on that sense. And then um, I came across, uh, um, you know, my previous um, boss or like at the hedge fund. And, you know, he was quite keen on doing something in that space. And he asked me to kind of you know, research around it. And, and I've done tons of research back in summer in line with investing a lot in crypto, including leverage. And, and by the way, I also sold, sold everything on Sunday. It's come out because of, after six months trading, you kind of know after Sunday, there is a Monday dip. Um, but um, yeah, so I got a huge conviction around that this is an interesting area to kind of help the project on and help to kind of push it uh, ahead now with, or you know, um, and and yeah, so Noah uh, and I, you know, happy to talk. I mean, of course, that's now the fact. And this is how we've come to Noah. This is the journey, basically, so far to yeah. get to here now. Okay. Yeah, and I've done like a lot of like rabbit hole stuff uh, and talking to, you know, people from MakerDAO and everyone. Um, and 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 it's, it's quite impressive. And I think, you know, it will get there. Now, I'm not sure if it's this year or next year. Like adoption really takes time might take time. It depends also on like, you know, who helps us. Um, but, but it is really, you know, when you look at crypto, um, you realize these guys are so innovative, like it's just unlike anything you've seen. But, but yeah. So what is Noah then? What is it? So, so um, Noah is basically, uh, so we, we have a very strong belief or thesis that, um, if anywhere in the world, um, cryptocurrencies or, or, or will adopt at a faster rate in, in, in maybe other countries, 
or more, more at the global scale, some emerging countries. And, 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 and you know, that's not too far fetched. If you look at, for example, China in, um, with e-commerce back in 2006, 2005, I don't remember exactly, but people were divesting, like Goldman Sachs was selling his stocks to um, SoftBank and people were trying to get out after the, the first, um, I think it was the SARS um, incidents that there was a huge uh, you know, crisis in China. Um, so people were like selling. SARS, that was in the early like, 2000s, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and then you saw, you know, basically um, US, you know, going crazy growth. And then you looked at China e-commerce, it was small. So people were like, why would I invest in China when, when you know, US is basically like the giant. But then within maybe five, six years, China overtook GMV of US. And, and a lot of people got that wrong because the reason like why e-commerce stopped it in China was it was solving a bigger problem, right? So in China, you don't have retail, traditional retail. So traditional retail penetration is extremely low versus U US. So when for US e-commerce is basically like a additional product to whatever infrastructure, infrastructure they have. So it's not the most necessary thing they need. It's nice to have because it's convenient, but they have, you know, so many stores like they can go to, including Walmart and these guys. In China, you don't have that. So what you opened up in China was the floodgate to consumerism, basically, right? So for the first time, these guys were able to buy products. They didn't need to go, let's say in a local area, they didn't need to go to like a um, local shop and, and speak to these people and try to figure out how to get something, you know? So you got for the first time a variety of products open up to Chinese and that basically accelerated pace and then everything with that. Now, in a, in a lot of emerging markets, let's say Nigeria or South Africa and these countries, is um, the issue is that these guys were never financially, it was never working. It starts from central bank, it was starts with bank, like it's, it was never like a good solution there. Um, and, and we believe that cryptocurrencies infrastructure will enable us to leapfrog um, that development to kind of financially include every citizen of all of these countries um, because it has the scalability uh, it can act globally as well as crypto native we don't need to act on the traditional fiat rails where we need to comply with twenty thousand regulations at least not for now so we can expand um, so yeah so we we have for the first time the opportunity to um bring financial rev basic innovation to these markets. Um, and, and, and that will be pretty huge. Okay. Bringing financial innovation to those markets, pioneering that, that yeah. sounds incredible. It sounds like the next big thing, but how are you going to do that? What, what, what will you be doing? What is it actually going to do? Noah? So, so first of all, um, we made sure we partner with the leading emerging. So we have the leading emerging market investors uh, in our so in our round, um, and they have you know all sorts of involvement from invested in the top fintech companies in those markets, in mostly also banks and wallets, being very close to the regulatory uh, um, environment there um, with uh, you know central banks anyone so. We, so basically we partner with the right people or at least have the right investors on board who can basically help us to um, take the first partnership upon our launch. Now, what the first product will be is a simple consumer product. Um, now, the issue you have in all those markets is not that they don't have access to crypto, it's that the only access they have is like the exchange form, right? So basically like speculation nature, like finance or whatever, like you have basically solutions that are tailored towards the use case of um, speculation, um, which basically excludes those users or consumers who would be looking to store and bank crypto seamlessly. And, um, and so what we want to do is basically bring a product to the market that enables people very simply get safe in the crypto world because their alternative asset, let's say Naira in Nigeria, depreciates at a 20% every year, <clears throat> right? So their alternative asset, let's say 
their, their own currency is bad, then let's say, um, let's say um, real estate, most of its people don't have the money to buy real estate to kind of like save uh, in a meaningful way. Stocks, they only have access to local stocks and you don't want to know the compliance rules of those kind of companies in, in, in those in those markets. Like it's basically like the, the, re, the retail investor is, you know, trying to get probably get screwed over. So um, crypto is for them the only access they have to a, a stable savings uh, way um, and, and being able to like work hard, put it in, a, in, a, in an environment where it's safe, as well as knowing that it's like managed, you know, globally and not like, you know, corruption or, or, or money printing going on. Um, so it's important to kind of touch on that use case and not the speculation one. So how can we enable the consumer of all those markets to come trust us very easily be able to turn their savings into crypto, then bank them. So bank them, I mean, like, can we save them and earn interest on our deposits, both stable coins and cryptocurrencies, as well as lend against their assets to be able to make everyday purchases? You know, do we give them a credit card against their holdings so they can go without selling their holdings, they can already go spending um, in their local currency. Um, so basically, how do we make crypto bankable? Uh, in those markets. So for a place consumers. for them to sh just like I go to the bank or not necessarily physically have to go these days, but just like I open a bank account and I store all my money, fiat money there, basically. That's the same thing, a place where a bank where they can store their cryptocurrency. So somewhere other than their digital wallet, for example, yeah. is that what you're trying to replace? So store and manage and feel secure about it. So store, manage uh, and earn interest as well as lend against it. So you want to be able to like say, OK, I, I have saved, let's say, worth of 30,000 of Bitcoin. Now, I don't want to sell my Bitcoin if I need, for example, this month, a bit of cash, but I can get cash against my holding um, so I can you know, do my day to day until I can pay it back. Right. So it's kind of like collateralized lending. Um, okay. And and so basically enable them having a bank as well as, you know, saving well, but also managing their day to day um, lives um, by just going fully crypto native and not needing any, any local banks. So in this case, would the consumers no longer need a wallet, if that's the case, a digital wallet, because they can simply store their you know, digital currency, their cryptocurrency story with Noah. So are you in a way tackling one of the criticisms of crypto that, you know, if I have a cryptocurrency, one of the biggest uh, problems I would need to be aware of is uh, hacking, basically. My own wallet, digital, my digital wallet yeah. could get hacked. So are you technically solving that problem? So it's not, I, think, I don't think it's a problem that is becoming... Uh, it's not the biggest issue right now. I mean, it used to be three, four years ago, but you know, the infrastructure around the community has become better. So I think hacking, yes, but, but it's more a place for the everyday user to come in and not just the speculative user. Like it's the everyday user who is aware that wants to use crypto, but it's like, let's say a Binance is just extremely sophisticated to understand how to buy a store and use like, you know, if I have Binance or let's say another exchange platform, yeah, I have to get money out and I have to get it to my bank to be able to spend it, but then it's just too many friction. But what if we all keep it in one ecosystem, in one bank, but then help you to make the everyday use cases by not leaving our ecosystem? So you are targeting, as a start, the experienced consumer. You're not exactly targeting people yeah. who are looking to get into cryptocurrency, people who are already using cryptocurrency they've been you know they're they're quite well educated on the subject and they understand everything there is to know from a consumer perspective at least yeah yeah makes sense no oh. um totally yeah because if you look at it like the the first wave of a lot of products were coming you know custody solution aml solutions you know all these like back end and and, and, and the internalization of the crypto but now the next wave will be the user interface. How do you make it open to the world? 
and and you know how for example let's say you know DeFi is a great way to save um to earn interest against your farm but you can't expect from the everyday user to go and farm right you just basically need to provide them the inter in, interface so they cannot worry about where the money is being allocated as long as it's secure and it provides them with the highest yield now even the highest yield for itself in emerging markets no one has a yield or like high yield right so they, let's say in, a, in nigeria they they save the money in a bank i don't know they get 10 percent interest seven percent interest but have 20 percent inflation so they are still losing out um so you will be able in the crypto world save in stable coins for example let's say usd um backed which is like let's say usd saving but I mean, but that's like given the market conditions right up with five to 10% interest rates. So not only are you providing them a way to save better, but also you're providing them a way to save better at the Western standard, which was never available before. Not really attainable where they are, where they live uh, at the time. Yeah, and, and that's basically it helps them to save finally and, 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 and build the future, like, or, or have at least a pen, like something that they come back on versus the local solution, which is basically your money is just getting um, printed away, basically. Now, obviously, cryptocurrency is, you know, it, it, it's on the rise, it's everywhere. Digital currency isn't there yet. There's a lot of talk about it, that it, it, it's going to come around. It's the central, the central bank's answer to cryptocurrency to try and regulate, uh, provide a regulated uh, digital currency. Yeah. Would that also be something Noah would be involved in later on down the line? Should it? Yeah. So we, we, we think we need to work alongside regulators and local, uh, uh, institutions to find their working solution because, you know, they, I mean, they also have their own worries and, and, and their own priorities for the country. So I, I don't believe in this pirate approach of, you know, we want to just disrupt, we need institution in those markets. But the, the only issue, they never had the means to manage it well. For the first time, they have the means to manage it well. And the second point is that in, every institution soon will be realizing um, that crypto is here to stay. Now, I have a very strong belief that every technology, so every technology that does something good for humanity and is needed will find its way, no, like, uh, no matter what the barriers are, or the, the interest rates of like, let's say the key stakeholders are. If the people need it and it improves lives, it will find its way. And I think there is no doubt that crypto will find its way uh, because it's just by far with all the stuff we can go through, it's it's so efficient and better. And I'm happy to talk to anyone who wants to question that. So you're um, pro regulations just, then? You're happy to say that now? You are pro regulation? No, no, regulation? no, not pro regulation. I'm, I'm, I'm saying it will find its way and regulators need to adopt, right? Regulators will do the why. Because, you know, you will have an instance where, um, let's imagine the US would have uh, banned the internet, right? They would never have Google or Facebook and all these amazing companies that they could have, like, you know, taxed or be proud of or build, like, extreme talent pool from. So every country will be realizing soon that it's going to be a competition against each other um, of who is going to help companies to be there. Um, look at Nigeria. They banned it a month ago. And the next thing was happened, Kenya announced they want to like ease up on, on crypto. So the, it's, it's here to stay and it's too late to stop. Um, and, and the countries will face two options. Either we ban it and we lose benefiting from it. Uh, or we embrace it and we can, you know, gain, gain a competitive advantage in our region. Do you see this then from your, from your perspective, do you see crypto, you know, at, at the moment, crypto is in a way um, reserved unofficially for those who know about crypto, for those who understand it. But most people around still don't really understand crypto, still are too afraid of crypto just because they hear the yeah. how how volatile it is i mean bitcoin just hit fifty thousand again um and that it can go up and down so everybody looks at crypto not everybody sorry but many people normal the everyday man or woman they look at it as something you invest in rather than you're using you could potentially use in the future um, not just as an investment do you see yeah. crypto reaching the everyday person or 
GC yeah. maintaining where, where its current position? Yeah, it will reach the everyday person, uh, definitely. And you can see the growth rate in all those countries. And you can also see like Nigeria is the second most aware country on, according to Google uh, around crypto because they just need it. Like they just need it. Like it's, 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 it's amazing. I mean, you can all check it for yourself, but a lot of these emerging markets have a high, high awareness on crypto and it will reach the everyday person. And you know, like, you know, in, internet has reached everyone, but do we really think about the technology and what's behind it and how HTTPS like protocol works and how these like, no, the everyday user doesn't because the interfaces have been so well built that you don't have to worry about it. Of course, at the moment you have to worry about it. You have to worry about hash keys and not too much. I mean, it's getting better, but you're still like at a stage where you've got to educate yourself a bit. Now the next wave of adoption will be like amazing interfaces, but also questions like how do we use, for example, to pay? Like, do we need to integrate with major, major e-commerce companies to enable people not even to convert into their local currency to buy something, but just to buy it correctly? Um, do we need to think about, you know, there are so many other use cases that, 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 that the whole thing with crypto is it's, start, it's basically starting to be used, right? But the speculation is still ahead, right? So how do we basically increase the day-to-day -day use, right? And that will make crypto more stable because people are not buying and selling just because they believe tomorrow will be going up because real people are buying and selling because they need it. And, and, um, and that will basically be more important than, um, you know, to, to determine, you know, kind of, that will be more of a value add. Like I'll make an example. Please do. Um, at the moment, right. Um, you know, so crypto's network is amazing. I can send you. I can send you like a coin now, let's say you're in Lebanon and you know how crazy the banking results are revenue. It's impossible because they have sanctions. Oh, over there, over there. But it's I can send you up. on the crypto network, your money within two minutes, one minute, actually less, you know? So um, with that, you know, next could be, how do we lend internationally? Because if you, if you look at it, every lending company at the moment is very, very, um, local right and that's the main reason is because of the regulation and fiat trails right it doesn't need to be local why do we not get capital here and allocate it somewhere in the world where we have the highest returns um and everything that like that will be changed everything that we know is true it will be different um another another case with crypto we could start so you know like how after the second world war like nation or the first second world war nations became a thing everyone started to issue passports everyone started to have a national identity which was the first sort of identity and then you have these like credit bureaus that you know came in and said guys you know like we're going to create a scorecard where if you behave well you're going to get credit if you behave well not well you're not going to get any credit so basically that was like kind of the rise of uncollateralized lending which enables people like to kind of like you know, it's kind of makes the market more efficient. But with crypto, we could do the same. We can build our own identity. Like we can create our own. So there are a number of projects. I mean, there's no nothing to mention. I mean, Facebook is also working on it. But having that and let's say a global scorecard and then the back end of crypto, being able to distribute money everywhere without any issues, you'll be able to like allocate money everywhere very efficiently where people actually can return the highest yield. Um, and, 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 or, or not even allocating, but for example, we know as a fact, and you can research that the emerging markets have the highest saving rates to anyone in the world. So they save on average 30 to 40% every year of the GDP. Uh, I mean, there are many reasons. One of the reason is they can't allocate a capital efficiency, but they keep the money. Um, the other one is, um, they, they don't have any security. So they start to save because there is nothing the government who backs you. But imagine that, and by the way, in 10 years, we will have a funding gap, like because no one is saving in the Western world because we are so comfortable like living with our credit cards and always going to government if there is anyone. But there is going to be a funding gap. And basically these guys, money could be used to fund the West and get extremely high yields back to the consumer. So basically it makes the market more efficient and, 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 and gives the people what they deserve because they are safe. They should earn the return on capital that is deserved at a global standard. 
and not at their local standard. So is NOAA then, you keep because we keep talking about emerging markets, the emerging markets, is NOAA going to be primarily aimed at emerging markets? Um, we will go first uh, stronger on emerging markets, but we want to build a global bank. I think, you know, like internet is global, right? All the products be global. Like crypto is global as well. There is no point of saying there is one country. I think there is a benefit of going global with a focus obviously on like, we want to build a very secure infrastructure that is for the unbanked or maybe like banked or people in the emerging markets who are looking to save as well as bank in a very sustainable way without worrying too much about, you know, um, other issues. Um, but we have some key countries that we're going after. We have them clearly analyzed. We know they're the highest volume driver and emerging markets for a fact are high volume drivers. Like, you know, now of course India has banned it, but you know, the number of volumes going through that country or even Nigeria is huge. And, um, so I think it's not only because you want to do an emerging market uh, crypto company. It's, it's also because we know the use case as we discussed of people looking for a safe way to store, save money and bank it, it's much, much bigger in those markets than let's say in Western markets, because in Western markets, you're competing with other stuff, right? Let's say local stock market, like they're all top real estate, you know, whatever, like you have so many other things. So um, it takes time in, 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 the, in, in, in the West because it's not a 10 X improvement. Something will only accelerate in adoption if it's a 10 X improvement. Otherwise people need time or COVID hits and people are forced to live in a certain way. Um, but in the, in Nigeria, it will, or like in emerging market, it will accelerate 10 X. Do you see Noah being to the cryptocurrency market? What maybe Monzo has been for banking the way yeah. it transformed things, the way it was. A, a, a disturber yet and organized in the same way it, it helps make it help made things easy just easy and yeah. more accessible it's good it's good i mean we, we, we you know what some of our advisors are from that space so you know previous like CF, cfos of that, that space i don't want to mention too many names right now but like you know even oak North, some executives um um as well as um, um starling um, and you know, it's always good to hear their stories because they had the kind of a similar upbringing. It was a lot of the, you know, kind of idea and theory, and then they brought a team together, had huge backers um, on day one. Um, so we are not that far from there, but I really strongly believe that the FinTech ecosystem will become idle because crypto is going to become the new standard in the next 10 years. So if I was an engineer, why would I work on something that will not be um, the thing that will change the world? Um, so in a way, I see fintech as kind of or like, let's say the current ones as kind of like an intermediary step. And they kind of accelerated the crypto space as well. Um, but I can pretty much imagine a world where we live off uh, cryptocurrencies um, because it's so much faster, efficient and cheaper just from a back end perspective. Now, Obviously, this is far. This is still very, very early days. Very early days, and I and you know, I, I know we will have another episode with you, another chat later on down the line when things have moved ahead. And I'm sure the conversation could be uh, different in terms of where you are at the time. But for now, why Noah and why now? Um, because, because of COVID, everyone is like printing money, like never before. Right. I think the world has come to realize that, you know, the crypto, I mean, the Bitcoin was basically started after the world's crisis, like, you know, financial crisis, because people were like, well, who are these governments kind of like doing whatever they want, but not caring about the end and, and touch point. Um, but I think with COVID people came to realize that, you know, um, in a world where everything gets inflated, right? Printed, printed, printed to pay up for all these costs, you know, and then there's so much, there's so much like stuff going on. Like you don't even want to know like money getting stolen, like the, all these mask stories where 
the government has given money to some people who made like huge profits of all we can, over we can, we can have we can have hours we can discuss yeah. that for hours i'm not but, even, let's not even go yeah. there but you got to know for every 100 million is, that is going to be printed is actually the redistribution of wealth and and it's basically at the expense for the hard working people who, who also happen to save now the capital holders and the rich they will always um, become richer because once um, currency starts to inflate, asset holders uh, gain because you know basically their assets are limited, but then money becomes uh, increased supply, so then the asset goes up in value. But the everyday person loses out every time. That's why the, the, the this difference between rich and poor is. So the problem has become extremely severe, and I think in the next couple of years, look, of course, like the stock market has been crazy, the crypto market has been crazy, but let's be honest, this has only been crazy because so much money has been around, and the money supply in the market is is huge. Um, but in one to three years, we'll see that people are tired of the system because um, you know it's not working, and 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 Noah um, is coming at the very right time, um, where we know because of that cryptocurrencies will adopt um, because of the you know kind of worsening of the problem. And, and a new system will become the standard. And, and if you look at like, you know, Bitcoin, right? The supply is limited, right? So there's only 21 million Bitcoins by 2020, 2030. Um, so if we start to tr talk in Bitcoin and trade in Bitcoin, no one can say, oh, amazing. Let's print more Bitcoin so we can pay off our debt. It's just one unit that we use um, that is the, the best way. So I think why now? The world needs it ever before because there is going to be a lot of uh, issues coming out of this uh, pandemic. Um, a lot of people come to realize that you know, um, the, you know, the money has been inflated massively, especially in those emerging markets that we're talking about. Um, and they will see that crypto is a, a better version of living life because, of course, we have volatility right now. But over the next two three years, and no 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 doubt, it will be more than 100k. I don't know, 150, 200K, uh, because its supply is limited. So the more people move to it, the more, the more valuable it becomes. And then it becomes the universal way of uh, transacting. And are you hoping that Noah will play that part, will play a part in getting people yeah. more into crypto? Yes, so we will play the part of like adoption. Um, we will play the part as well as it's more, not only pro I mean, of course, we need to be pro profit to be able to uh, manage expenses, but we want to help first priority, like touch people's lives um, at, at scale. Um, and that's why we're also based in the UK, because from one, we think we have the best people here, best talents. We can work on this collective problem. But two, I know a lot of these countries, they prefer these banks being somewhere else because then you basically also trust them. Um, you know, as you know, in Many of these countries, they even prefer foreign products because they don't lost trust their local authorities. So yeah, I think we'll be a key. Um, and you know, the first product will be consumer based, but you know, there's going to be the back end will be used for I don't know commercial banking as well. Like how do we enable every SMB in those markets to hold their treasury in the, in the cryptocurrencies? Uh, that's also like one thing that we have sketched out because we have mostly invested in all those companies, so we can roll over quite quickly. But for now, we want to do what's, what is needed for the people, and then we'll assess from there where we can um, create more value. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, look, the, the, from the sound of it, the road is only up. Well, you were just starting anyway, so it has to go only up from here. But uh, I have to say, I'm very excited about this journey, and I'm excited yeah. to have this conversation again. When do you think we can end up having it? Six months or 12 months? How long do you think? Whatever. I mean, I think maybe after the product has been launched, you know, um, as I'm helping these guys to ramp up. But um, yeah, I think in six months we'll be launching. Six months. So you're launching six months. Probably worth doing this another chat in 12 months time to see how the launch, how Noah's doing six months after the launch. Yeah. Sounds great. Yeah, correct. Sounds great. Yeah. Shah, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Uh, we have... Uh, I would say that, uh, look, apologies, this might have taken a bit too long, given that you are water fasting at the moment. But from what you told us at the start, you seem to be used to it by now. So No, it's totally fine. So you're completely I've fine. I've been clear in my life. Exactly. I'm sure you live, I've never you live, been clear in my you, life. You're used to it by now. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, enjoy the rest of your evening.
Till we speak soon. Thanks a lot, Mustafa. Great to speak. Bye Thank bye. you. Bye bye.